When Belisarius sailed out of Carthage in the spring of 534, the Vandals were defeated, but the Moors were still causing problems. The Moors had been generally non-committal during the Vandal War, only deciding on loyalty to the Eastern Romans once it became clear that they would be the victors. But that did not mean that they were big fans of the Eastern Roman Empire, and they quickly became a thorn in the Roman side. The Moors began raiding Byzacena as soon as news broke that Belisarius was leaving the continent. Two Roman units were sent out to counter them, but these units were cut off by a larger Moorish force and soundly defeated. Solomon, the Eastern Roman prefect in charge of the territory, responded by marching a large force out of Carthage. He met the Moors head-on in a pitched battle, which the Eastern Romans won decisively. The Romans then marched back to Carthage for the winter, probably believing that was that. But that was not that. The Moors regrouped, and the raids continued throughout the winter and into the spring. Solomon was again forced to gather his army and meet the threat head on. The Moors, though, had learned a valuable lesson from their first encounter. Meeting the Eastern Roman army in open battle was not an easy thing to do. So instead, the Moors built a fortified encampment on Mount Borgian and forced Solomon to come to them. Approaching the encampment directly would have been very difficult, but Solomon was able to sneak a detachment up the other side of the mountain overnight, and at daybreak, the Moors found themselves under attack from both sides. The result was another decisive Eastern Roman victory, and the Moors fled into the Aures Mountains. The Romans gave chase. The terrain was treacherous, but the Moors were very familiar with the region and able to easily traverse the peaks and valleys. Solomon's men, however, were unfamiliar with the region and struggled to keep pace. Solomon decided that he needed to travel lightly and ordered his men to only take minimal supplies on the pursuit, hoping that this would allow them to move quicker. But his plan backfired. The Eastern Romans lost sight of the Moors, and their limited food supply was quickly exhausted. Solomon was forced to turn his men around and head back to Carthage for the winter without finishing off the enemy. His army was overworked and underfed as they returned to Carthage, but there were other problems that had been weighing on their minds even before this. When the Vandal army was defeated, many Vandal women were left widowed. Eastern Roman soldiers swooped in and married these women, hoping that the land owned by the now-deceased husbands would then pass to them. But there was a problem. Some of these lands had been seized by Vandal King Geyseric in the 5th century, and Justinian decided that those lands would be returned to their original owners. Other lands had been obtained by other means, but those were now deemed the property of the Roman treasury, not the soldiers who were cultivating them. Furthermore, these lands were subject to a land tax, meaning that the soldiers would be paying to farm the land that they thought would be theirs. Additionally, there were at least 1,000 Roman soldiers who were Aryan Christians. The Vandals, too, had been largely Aryan, but the Roman state was Orthodox. Justinian had initially been lenient towards the Aryan churches in Africa and hoped that they would gradually be admitted into the Nicene Orthodoxy. But the Nicene priests and bishops in Africa had faced some persecutions under the Vandals, and now that the shoe was on the other foot, they were not in favor of a peaceful coexistence. These bishops met at Carthage under Reparatus, the bishop of the capital city, and demanded that Justinian take a hardline stance against the Aryans. The emperor acquiesced. He decreed that Aryan church property was to be seized, and Aryans were no longer permitted to practice their faith. Notably, there was no exception made for Aryan soldiers in the Roman ranks. The Aryan priests made sure that these soldiers knew this. They had won the war, after all. Why, they asked, were they now being punished for it? And there was a third problem. And this one's a biggie. The soldiers weren't getting paid. Taxes were still being collected, but paychecks were around six months behind. 
Let this be a lesson to any of you, should you ever find yourself in charge of an ancient or medieval state. You need to make sure your army gets its money. Trust me on this, it's very, very important. These issues all weighed heavily on the minds of the soldiers as they trudged back to Carthage for the winter of 535-536. Meanwhile, a small group of about 400 Vandal soldiers was making its way back to Africa. These men had been taken to Constantinople as prisoners in 534, and then incorporated into the Roman army and sent to the east. But these men had managed to break away and sailed back to their homeland. They linked up with the Moors and got word to dissatisfied Romans that they would back a mutiny if one took place. The angry soldiers, now with backup, decided that enough was enough and put a plan into motion. On Easter 536, Solomon was to be assassinated in Carthage's basilica. However, the would-be assassins got cold feet and could not go through with the deed. They regrouped and planned to try again the next day, but again, they got cold feet. The conspirators openly blamed each other and argued about fault in the public marketplace. This made the plot public knowledge. The would-be assassins fled the city and began to raid the countryside. When Solomon heard of the plot, he urged the soldiers still in the city to remain loyal to him and to the emperor. But five days later, the angry men gathered in Carthage's Hippodrome and their anger boiled over. Solomon sent Theodorus to calm the mob, but his efforts were to no avail. The mutineers actually thought that Theodorus would join them, and they elected him their leader by acclamation. Theodorus was still loyal to Solomon, but thinking quickly, did not let the angry mob know of his true intentions. This bought Solomon enough time to find a place to hide from the mob, which soon broke out of the Hippodrome and into the city streets, killing supporters of Solomon and robbing anyone they could find. That night, Solomon, along with Martinus, his second in command, and Procopius, who recorded these events, snuck their way to Theodorus' home. There, they ate dinner and then found their way to a boat that they could sail to Sicily. Martinus stayed behind and was tasked with heading out to Numidia to attempt to keep soldiers stationed there from joining the rebellion. Belisarius was in Sicily, preparing for an invasion of Italy. When Solomon arrived and broke the news of the mutiny, Belisarius gathered around 500 men and immediately sailed for Africa. Meanwhile, the mutineers had left the city and regrouped with the would-be assassins out in the countryside. This was a huge mistake. They never should have left the city and allowed it to be fortified against them. Theodorus took this opportunity to gather whatever loyal troops he could find and prepared to defend the city. The rebels proclaimed Stotzis, one of Martinus's bodyguards, as their king and prepared to march back to Carthage. Stotus' army consisted of about 8,000 men. They were mostly disgruntled Eastern Roman soldiers, but included in their ranks roughly 1,000 vandals, the 400 who had rerouted themselves back to Africa, and about 600 others who had survived the Vandalic War. When they found that Carthage was being defended, they demanded that Theodorus surrender the city to them. Theodorus refused. He sent a man named Josephius, a relative of Belisarius, to negotiate with Stotzis. But Stotzis would have none of it. He had Josephius killed and commenced a siege of Carthage. Belisarius arrived while the city was under siege and entered the city under cover of night. The next morning, when the mutineers learned that Belisarius had returned, they hastily broke off the siege and retreated. Belisarius rounded up approximately 2,000 men that remained loyal within the city. He had cash on hand, enough to appease them for the time being and keep their loyalty. He led his army out of the city and in pursuit of Stotzis and the rebels. He cut up to them near Membressa, about 40 miles from Carthage along the Bagradas River. According to Procopius, Belisarius addressed his soldiers before the battle. His speech began, The situation, fellow soldiers, both for the emperor and for the Romans, falls far short of our hopes and of our prayers. 
for we have now come to a combat in which even the winning of the victory will not be without tears for us, since we are fighting against kinsmen and men who have been reared with us. But we have this comfort in our misfortune, that we are not ourselves beginning the battle, but have been brought into the conflict in our own defense. For he who has framed the plot against his dearest friends, and by his own act has dissolved the ties of kinship, dies not if he perishes by the hands of his friends, but, having become an enemy, is but making atonement to those who have suffered wrong. And after further describing the dastardliness of the mutineers, Belisarius told his men that while they may be outnumbered, they would be victorious. With great contempt, therefore, as I said, we should go against this enemy of ours, for it is not by the numbers of the combatants, but by their orderly array and their bravery that prowess in war is wont to be measured. Stotzis addressed his men with his own message, appealing to their anger over their mistreatment that led to the mutiny. Men who with me have escaped our servitude to the Romans, let no one of you count it unworthy to die on behalf of the freedom which you have won by your courage and your other qualities. And he closed by emphasizing his army's numerical advantage and, in his opinion, their strength of character. And the conflict will not be evenly matched in regard to strength, for not only are the enemy greatly surpassed by us in numbers, but they will come against us without the least enthusiasm, for I think that they are praying for a share of this, our freedom. The Battle of Membressa, also known as the Battle of the River Bagradas, was short. When the two armies lined up, the rebels were facing a fierce wind. This would hinder the effectiveness of their archers and aid the Romans. Stotus tried to reposition his men by moving them to the flank, but he did not provide cover for his army while they maneuvered. Belisarius saw an opportunity and attacked the disorganized lines. The rebels broke immediately. Stotus and his men fled south to Numidia. Those that remained on the field, mostly vandals, were cut down. And Belisarius allowed his victorious men to plunder the enemy camp. Belisarius did not give chase to the remaining mutineers. There were rumors that his army in Sicily might also mutiny, and the war in Italy was imminent. With the rebels in retreat, Belisarius left Theodorus in charge of mopping up and sailed for Sicily in May of 536. There was no truth to the rumors of a mutiny on the island, but nevertheless, the campaign in Italy could not wait. Africa was still not entirely pacified, and Stotus would continue to make trouble. The Romans would deal with that in due time. But for Belisarius, the Ostrogoths were the primary target. <laughs> Thank you.